Hi, I'm Dr. Ben Newman, and this is Ask Dr. Ben, where I try to answer your questions. Now, this is a question that some of the other questions have danced around, but nobody's directly asked this. So maybe this is a no one asked uh, episode, but why not? So the question would be, can a virus change to suit its host? Um, answer one is that anything's possible because uh, viruses explore evolutionary possibilities faster than anything else. Um, compare virus growth to like, I don't know, the fastest living thing uh, in terms of growing and dividing, probably bacteria. Uh, they sometimes only take uh, a few minutes to actually complete the cycle. But in those same bacteria, the viruses will also complete their replication cycle about the same time or a little shorter. And whereas the bacterium divides into two, the virus, when it goes in, will release 50, 100. In human cells, viruses can release 10,000 little virus particles. And each one of those can have changes. So whereas we, every, I don't know, 20, 30 years, have one or two children and we give them one or two, you know, random mutations each, viruses are doing this in a matter of minutes. And instead of having two kids, they're trying out 10,000 different possibilities. So it's just like a giant branching. So they explore the possible much faster than uh, you or I, very slow moving life forms ever could. So there's kind of a disconnect there. And so the real question would be, can a virus sense whether or not it is damaging the host? And I don't know that there is a firm answer for this, but I think it would be very, very difficult. As a virologist, I am skeptical because they're happening one on such different scales. So the host is this great big thing. And the thing that keeps a host alive is consciousness, brain stem function, stuff like that, which if you've got a virus that's replicating in the lungs, the body could have been dead for a couple hours. And as long as that cell is still alive, because you know they can get organs out of dead people and put them in ice and fly them to some other state and transplant them in. And the organ is still alive because the cells inside the organ were still mostly all alive. Um, so the virus wouldn't necessarily know if the organism is alive or dead. Cells inside the organism may well know whether the organism has died. Uh, one, there'd be a, a loss of uh, uh, blood, but you can put other things around there. You can uh, put an organ in some kind of medium that would keep it oxygenated, for example, and put it on ice to slow down the metabolism. Um, but there will be signals that cells pick up. Uh, they would have special receptor molecules and they could potentially pick up various signals on those. Viruses don't have that because viruses in general are not terribly tied to the success of their host. There are specific cases that I can think of where a virus survives because the host survives. Like there are some viruses in bacteria that will carry extra photosynthesis genes that temporarily help their host to build up more energy, do more photosynthesis, so that the virus can make more copies of itself and then burst out and have even more viruses. So it's like a, a delayed gratification, if you like, for the virus, um, but still pretty simple, pretty direct. And there aren't a lot of examples of longer term viral success being tied to host success. Um, there's an interesting one in, with a tomato plant and a fungus and a virus of the fungus which is really weird and interesting, but uh, ultimately uh, possibly the exception. There are also potential cases where um, how different wasps and insects will have viruses that are relevant to their replication cycle or relevant to paralyzing their prey so their babies can grow. So it, it can happen. Um, but in general, <clears throat> the virus is in it for itself. And so uh, the virus doesn't have any of these receptors in a generalized virus as far as you can generalize for these things. So there's probably no way that the virus can tell whether or not it is causing destruction to anything but the cell around it. And some viruses that are considered very mild, uh, take a random common cold rhinovirus. 
these things generally replicate by lysing the cell they're in. That's, that's the way the viruses get out. They use up everything inside the cell and then burst the cell open, like, a, like bursting open a dirty garbage bag and just releasing all these viruses everywhere. It is, um, yeah, absolutely brutal. You get a giant spike of virus coming out and we're like, oh, you have a cold? Oh, have some chicken soup. <laughs> it's tasty, salty, does nothing against viruses. But, you know, that, that's kind of the level of seriousness that, uh, yeah, we've kind of learned to uh, attribute to this. So, yeah, um, uh, there's really not a lot of direct correlation between cellular level stuff and organismal level stuff. Now, the case where that may be different is where it depends, where a virus's transmission depends on being in the host for a long time. For example, if you had a virus that came in one way and was only transmitted another way, and so it had to colonize one part of the body, then another, then another, then another, then presumably the virus would have to be adapted to, for the host to live at least long enough for the virus to make that entire trip. The virus's job, though, is to get into and out of the host so that it can get into another host and then out of that host and into another and out of another over and over and over again, much faster than uh, you or I would ever care to replicate. Um, and so, yeah, generally different time scales, different size scales, totally different goals. It's weird that you can have two things inside the same body that just have so little in common and yet are made of all the same stuff, but that's viruses. That's what makes them weird, what makes them kind of neat. So when people are saying, can the virus change to become more mild, which I hate that word, but yeah. <laughs> the answer is, I guess it could, but that would be a random change that could happen, but would not necessarily happen. And there's a pretty good reason to think it wouldn't happen just because there's no direct benefit for the virus. Because for the most part, this is a virus, SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus, that transmits before a person is really sick. Most people, once they are very sick, are sitting in a bed or sitting in a hospital bed or sitting in an ICU bed where there are actually very strict safeguards that will stop the virus from spreading, make it very unlikely to spread. So at that point, at the point where a person is sick enough to go to the hospital, the virus has no further uh, gain. It is unlikely to uh, yeah, see the world again. Um, and so that means, but it means that all the stuff that happened up to that point, that's where the virus transmits. And so basically, the virus, some of that virus has already left a person and transmitted on to other people before that person goes into the hospital. So the virus couldn't know, as if a virus had a brain, but it couldn't be selected based on that basis. Uh, I think that's very unlikely. Now, there's a corollary here. Because in the laboratory, we can and do all the time select for viruses that are less pathogenic, less able to cause disease, better able to grow but cause fewer effects on the cells. And that's because of human intervention. Not in the sense, not in the sci-fi sense that everybody thinks scientists are capable of Harry Potter style magic, which yeah, I don't know what I'd do with Harry Potter style magic, but uh, yeah, presumably it would make something better, right? Yeah. But no. Um, uh, in the sense that when we grow viruses in the lab, we put some virus on there and we grow it for a certain amount of time. And then we take off a sample of that virus and we do it again and we do it again and again and again and again. And so there's never a big consequence for the virus if it kills the cells or doesn't, or rather we're picking out viruses that come out fast, uh, really quick viruses. And we will often grow the viruses in cells where they wouldn't normally grow. An example of this, well, any virus really. But uh, so what do we grow uh, SARS-CoV-2 in? Like in a human, it grows, we think, mostly in type 2 pneumocytes um, and a little bit maybe in some cells around those and pretty much nowhere else. Uh, a little bit in some intestinal cells, uh, actually. Could grow in many other cells, generally doesn't get there. Um, 
so yeah, that, that's where it grows in people. What do we grow it in in the lab? Never type 2 pneumocytes because I'm not aware of a good type 2 pneumocyte cell line. In general, we need cell lines in order to grow these viruses. And uh, a cell line is like a cancer that retains enough properties of the original cell that it's still like that cell and it still works like that. Because remember, every cell in your body has the same DNA. You get the same genome. You just express different parts of it. And that's what makes a nerve cell different from a, uh, you know, colon cell. Yeah. Different from an eye cancer cell, whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you've got all, all these different cell types, but uh, you've only got certain ones that actually work well in the lab. So we grow SARS-CoV-2 in Calu-3 cells, um, uh, which are fine. Those are, a, I believe, a lung cell line. Um, we grow them in A549s, which are a human lung cell line, but they don't have enough of the actual receptor to let the virus in efficiently. So you have to put in an extra version of that receptor and put in a ton of it, and then you can grow it okay. Uh, and we have monkey cells uh, that we grow uh, this virus in, and it grows pretty well in the monkey cells, yeah. None of these are the cells that it normally grows in inside of a person. And if we were to put it into mice, that's fine. But generally, we put it into mice that are genetically modified so that they have the human receptor on every single cell everywhere, but they have more of it in certain parts. And so you get weird things in these mice. Like the virus will sometimes go up into their brain, which it generally doesn't do with people, stuff like that. Um, yeah, but it mimics some aspects of the disease. So essentially, when you're growing a virus in the lab, you're always doing something different to the way it would be growing in the real world. And a virus will always adapt as best it can to whatever its situation is. Because each time you put the virus in, there's going to be a mix of different viruses. As careful as you might be, the virus makes mistakes and some of those will be different. And no matter what kind of cell you put it in, as long as some viruses grow, some will have a little advantage over the others. And those will make more virus and they'll probably make it faster. And so when you scoop up a little of that virus to take it off and start the next round, voila! you have changed the virus population just by picking out one virus that was already there and now it's most of the population instead of a little bit. And over time, in general, you do end up with viruses that cause less disease in the animals because you have adapted the virus to grow in a kind of cell. You've made it really good at one thing and so it's not the best at another thing. And you say, well, how can that be? Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Science, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, just think of any Olympic athlete. In general, you take the world's best swimmer and you put them on the racetrack and they're not going to come in first, probably. <laughs> they will probably come in last. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's hard to be the best at everything. In fact, it's probably actually impossible to be the best at everything in a relatively competitive environment. Yeah. Yeah. If it ever seems like anybody is the best at everything, it probably means the environment is not particularly competitive. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a very wide thing. And that's it. That's it. So, yeah. So that's why I don't think there's any real case for this virus ever somehow weakening yeah, because it hasn't weakened at all yet. It has just got better at infecting people who already have some immunity, which only means that people who were protected before are now no longer protected because the virus has found a way around that protection. It's not the vir that the virus is hurting anyone less. It's that it is able to still hurt people who should have been protected and who were protected against all the other versions of the virus that have now gone extinct because they couldn't operate in a world where most people had some immunity. So herd immunity against this thing works really well on the old strains, which are dead. Yeah, so we missed our chance on that one. And the new strains have evolved to get around herd immunity. And yeah, I, I'm not saying it's impossible. It probably is possible to contain this, but it would take a lot of vaccination, a lot of effort in a very concentrated time frame. Probably a six month time frame is all you could expect. And so, yeah, if you could get a dose into every single person in a dose of vaccine uh, within six months, 
on the planet, I think that would control the virus permanently and it would be gone. Um, short of that, I don't know that you're going to do it. So there you go. All right. So there's an explainer for something nobody asked about uh, because, I don't know, it's worth putting out there, right? Yeah, worth talking about these things. Thanks very much. This has been Ask Dr. Ben.